about two years ago, I started a company called Splice. And Splice is changing the world of music production by bringing a lot of the software engineering tools and techniques to the world of music creation. So essentially, we built a version control um, like Git and the social aspect like GitHub and also Spotify for samples, loops, and presets. So when we were working on the idea and what we wanted to build, we knew that we would have to deal with a lot of data, uh, a lot of requests, because every time a musician is working on his or her workstation and they're saving the work, it will make API calls to us, push a lot of data, and we knew that we would have to write a very efficient code. And we were not really sure how we would be doing that, so I did a lot of research at the beginning. So this is a very high-level view of our stack, where we have at the bottom uh, or the top, depending on how you want to look at it, we have web APIs, and we have clients and uh, different kind of cli clients, desktop or web, talking to these web APIs. The handlers are taking this request, processing the request, and in a lot of cases, uh, they will push a message into a distributed um, queue uh, that is, uh, that is uh, running on the cloud, and this queue then gets processed by processors running on servers, and they would take the files, decode them, transcode them, uh, process them, create reports, and store the data into different places. To give you an idea, uh, we're pushing about three terabytes of data every day outside of the system, and that's without caching. So it's quite a lot of data, um, and we need to do a lot of that uh, asynchronously. We need to do that uh, in an efficient way. And as you can imagine, we have a lot of messages coming at once. And when we design the system, we needed a way that would be obviously efficient, fast, but also uh, a way that we can maintain and debug the code. Um, and that's a big challenge with uh, running call in code in parallel. It gets really tricky to do uh, in, in a good way, especially with languages we had in the past. It would be a bit hard for me to explain what we're doing and how we do that and do a code review of so many lines of code. So I'd like to simplify a little bit uh, the challenge and uh, let's pretend we're building, uh, we're opening a restaurant here in Paris, and we're gonna call it Chez René. And Chez René, there's something a bit special. Um, they don't really have cooks, they have gopher chefs. Um, so our gophers are our chefs, but remember we're in France, and there are a lot of social rules here, and one of those uh, is that a chef, after cooking, has to take a break. The unions are pushing for it, you, there's no way around it, after every single dish that's being cooked, the gopher has to take a break. Um, we we'll also pretend to keep things simple that the, the chefs are getting all the orders at once, processing them, cooking them, and then as soon as they're all cooked, and we try to do that as soon as possible, we're gonna shut down the restaurant. And the goal is to do that the best way possible. So let's write some code. Um, and uh, this is our data model, pretty straightforward. Uh, you can see we're creating uh, logs, and our logs is a, a slice, uh, a map um, with a timestamp, and then a message, which is a string. The order itself has a dish name, uh, uh, an order number, so we can refer to it, and then there's the duration. That's the duration it takes for us to cook, um, or for a gopher to cook the order. And then the chef, and that's our gopher chef, um, has a station, uh, ID, a number for the station, as a name, and as a state to know if he's busy or not. A constructor is pretty straightforward also. Uh, we just take a name and a station, and then we return a pointer to our chef. Nothing crazy. A chef needs to know how to cook, so we need a method on the chef. So the problem we might have is we might concurrently have people asking the chef to cook something, so we need to check if the, the chef is busy or not. So we have this is busy uh, method on the chef. And if, he, if he's busy, we're just gonna wait and check again, 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 until he's not busy anymore. Once he's not busy, we're gonna set it as busy. We're gonna uh, print some logs. And uh, then we're gonna make it slip for the duration of the order. So remember in the order we said it takes a certain amount of time to cook the dish. This is uh, the duration. So we just slip and then rewrite to other logs and then finally, according to the French laws, we have to take a, take a break. So we have a fixed uh, time break of uh, 100 milliseconds, and then we release the state uh, of busy to not be busy anymore. 
Now you might be wondering what is the code for BZ and not BZ. So here's the, the code. One is checking the state and returning a Boolean. And if you've done C++ or Java, you recognize the use of, of mutexes. It's not the greatest code, but it's thread safe. Now let's jump in into the entry point of the code, how we start the code. And you can see that the first thing we do is we define our two chefs. So on one hand, we have Francois, and on the other hand, we have Rose. So these are the two little chefs. Uh, they have different stations, and they're going to cook a long list of orders. So of course, they're going to cook French dishes. And each dish has a different duration because the preparation of a soup uh, versus veal will take a different amount of time. So I cut, uh, in the example, I cut the amount of orders, but they're going to cook about, I think, 10 or 15 dishes. We start a timer, and then we fire the orders to the chefs. Once that's done, we're going to print the fact that we're closing the kitchen. We're going to print the logs one by one. Nothing really hard. As you can see, everything is happening into the fire function. So um, let's think about how we would write that. So the first thing that comes to mind um, is we want to look through all the orders, and we want to find a chef that's available and uh, give it the order. So we're looping through the orders. We get the first order. We look through the chefs until a chef is not busy, and we ask it to, to cook the order and then break the loop. So when we break the loop, we go back to the next order, and we do the same thing. And I hooked up um, this Arduino-based device that has three LEDs. The first LED to the left is for Francois, the, the first chef. And the one to uh, your right will be for Rose. And then in the middle, that's when we close down the kitchen. Um, so I'm going to go and run the code. All right. Can you, see the, can you see the LEDs? Yep. All right. So let's run the code. All right, so we can see Francois is cooking the first blanquette de veau, is resting, okay. Well, it looks like we're having a bit of an issue here. Francois is the only one working, but he's working really hard. Tartatin, I really like tartatin, that's really good. Tatouille, okay. Well, okay, we just closed the store. It took us 15 seconds. Um, we see the logs, and yeah, so Francois cooked everything. So it's a little bit like, uh, that there's one person doing all the work and the other ones are just encouraging them around, right? This is not why I chose Go. Um, I would use Ruby or Python if I wanted that, right? Uh, or JavaScript. All right, let, let's move on. Um, let's do it better, right? We're, we're good developers. We all know Go. So Go has a magical keyword that Veronica really likes so much. It's the Go keyword. So we can just make or chefs cook in a go routine. So let's do that. And let's run the code. Okay. All right. All right. And whoa, that's super fast. Well, I have to say go is really, really fast. We cooked everything in 400 microseconds. Okay, there's something wrong there. Uh, it looks like if you look at the LED, Francois is still cooking, so I guess he actually never cooked anything because what happened is we just fired all the Go routines and exited. So maybe concurrency in Go is not as easy as it sounds. All right, well, let's look at that. Let's see if we can do better. All right, the problem is we forgot to put a weight group. We have to wait until uh, all the orders are cooked. So let's add uh, a weight group, which we do on top here. And then uh, we're going to have a for loop. So we're going to have a loop that's going to keep on going. And if you notice just above the loop, we have a label, uh, this arrow loop. And that's going to be used once our chef is done cooking uh, or when we actually send the request to the, the chef that was not busy. We're going to break this loop so we can go to the next order. And then finally, uh, we're going to wait uh, that all the orders are being cooked. So if you don't know what a weight group is, it's basically an incremental counter, and you want to increment it and decrement it, and we can wait until it goes back to zero. So we have to implement a new uh, method called uh, cook and yell, so that the chef is going to cook and be like, hey, I'm done, and get the order from probably the waiter. So cook and yell takes the weight group. It's the same as the cook method we had before, but there is a weight group. And this weight group will be incremented by one. Uh, we're going to check if uh, the chef is busy. We're going to do the same routine as before. But now the cooking is happening in a go routine, so we can 
uh, we can leave uh, early on. We don't have to actually wait uh, at that point. And inside this go routine, uh, we're going to be cooking for the duration of the order. We're going to write our logs. And then we're going to rest and pass the wait group to this new uh, method called rest and yell. And this rest and yell method is going to take the wait group. And after sleeping for the fixed amount of time, it's going to reset the busy state and then close, uh, I mean, say, de decrement the wait group. So if you remember, we were waiting at the bottom for the wait group. We can exit here. So all right, let's go and run this code and see if it works. Iteration. All right, OK, so now they are actually cooking at the same time. And it's blinking green and blue. And we can see that Rose and Francois are cooking. They're resting. Everything looks pretty good. And we close the store in 9.8 nine second, 9 seconds. It's not bad, but I'm not really proud of the code we just wrote. Um, it's not really nice. And the problem with having code that's so messy is that more than likely there's a bug somewhere in there. And I know that the next person that's going to come after me might actually not understand what I was trying to do and change things that would break it. So how can we fix that? Well, often problems can be mapped to real life situations. So how do they fix this issue in restaurants? In restaurants, they use something that's called an order wheel. I don't know if you've ever seen that. But this is what an order wheel looks like. And the order wheel is where all the orders go on. And then the chefs come, pick an order, go and cook something, and then bring back the dish. So we could implement our own order wheel by using a channel. So our channel is a channel of orders. And we're going to start, we're going to loop through all the chefs. And for each chef, um, we're going to ask them to um, loop through this order wheel, pick something to cook. And then when they're done, go back and pick something else. So we don't have to try to map or to match the order to the chef. We can let the chef pick the order. Now, we do need to populate uh, the order wheel. So what we do is we look through all the orders, and then we push them onto the channel. Once we're done with that, we can close the channel. What's nice with closing the channel is that the go routines where the chef is executing, uh, once the channel is closed, it will just exit, and then it will be done. The beauty of this code is that we can remove all the mutexes we have at the beginning. We don't need to use locks, and it simplifies our code drastically. So let's go ahead and run it. It's connecting to the hardware and sending the request. We can see there it's blinking well. So we have Francois and Rose, and he exited. But oh, look at my board. There's a problem. And looking at the logs, I can tell you what the problem is. We closed the kitchen before the last two uh, go routines were done. The chefs were not done cooking the last dish, but we actually closed the kitchen. And that's because we uh, went through and closed the loop without waiting for the chefs. And that's a very, very common bug. And that's one that I actually wrote a few times myself. And I always need to make sure I don't do this mistake. So let's fix that, and let's add um, a weight group. But this time, instead of putting a weight group on the, um, the order, let's put it on the chef. So we, we have our own weight group at the beginning, and we're going to increment the weight group uh, for each chef we start. So we only sh start two chefs, so uh, it will be incremented by two. And then when the channel is closed and the go function will exit, we'll close done. Uh, we'll basically call done. So the wait group uh, will be cleared, and we can just wait for it at the bottom. So at this point, we should be able to loop through um, to do exactly what we were doing before, but wait for the last dishes to be run, to be uh, prepared. So let's give that a try. All right, they're cooking, cooking, resting, cooking. They're cooking really fast. It's a lot of food. All right, so it went, it went well, 7.8 seconds. Uh, we can see that the kitchen closed, the light is red, but everybody else was done cooking. So everything was cooked. Uh, all the customers got their food, and it worked well. So we solved, uh, we solved the problem. 
Now, there is one more bug. Did any of you see the bug? Can I just see some hands if you've seen the bug? No? So, um, there is a data race in my code. And an easy way of doing that is to run go run or inside your test with the dash race flag. And if you do that, it will give you a warning like that. And it tells me that I have a data race somewhere in my code. And if I look at it, this is where my bug is. Can anybody see it? Can I get some hands? Yeah, you can see it? Well, so the problem is that I have multiple Go routines writing to the same map. And we're not in Ruby, we're not in Python, we don't have a global interpreter lock. So two Go routines are gonna try to write to the same uh, memory address and it's gonna overwrite, one will overwrite the other. Even though everything seems to look fine, there's a data race here. So we need to fix it. But you know what, I'm not gonna fix it. I'm gonna let you fix it. And I want you, if you paid attention, to find a solution and tweet it at me. Uh, or tweet it at, at .go so I can see how you guys solve the problem and make sure that I actually taught you something. Uh, I will also be around, so if you want to discuss it, we can talk about it. But wh what is my point of showing you this example? Well, what I hope you will remember is that writing concurrent code can be simple, but the first thing you need to do is to get rid, break the old habits. Um, if, you, if you already wrote concurrent code in the past, you might be used to certain, certain idioms like using mutexes, and you can see that using a mutex was working, but the code was really not that great. And if you can keep things simple, um, that would help a lot. And my rule is when I look at my code or code that's being written at the company, if the code is too complicated or looks complicated or a junior developer will not understand it, that probably means there's a better way, a simpler way of doing it. And that's what I like with, with Go. Finally, I really want you to think about macarons every time you write code because they're simple, they're delicious, and you can enjoy yourself. Thank you very much.